I believe strongly that if we're going to take the $32 billion freight forwarding industry and transform it into a catalyst for more sustainable commerce, we had to build a big company. And that meant that we had to bring in investors with deeper pockets than, you know, my local friends and family who have been very supportive, but aren't professional investors. $30 million. That's the amount Jetstream raised in a pre-series A round in January 2023 to provide logistic services for African businesses. Today, we are speaking to Misha Adi, the startup CEO, to learn about her experiences raising venture capital as an African and as a woman. She shares lots of valuable insights about her journey. So grab your popcorn and let's get into it. Raising funds is important to me. You've, you've raised two rounds of funding now and it's, it's important for businesses that want to scale really quickly. So what was the case for you? At what point did you decide that we need to raise funds for Jetstream? Jetstream is my second startup. And in my first startup, I uh, built it in California in the United States and never raised um, venture capital. I think one of the reasons that I didn't raise venture capital is because I sort of built the business without thinking about funding as part of the design of the business. I brought that lesson to Jetstream and wanted to do better the second time. So right around the time that Solomon and I were discussing supply chain issues in Africa and how to defragment the industry, I was also thinking about what type of business Jetstream was going to be and what resources we would need to pull in in order to get to our full scale. Because cross-border trade in Africa is a massive, massive opportunity, the continent, even even though it's completely underrepresented, it still does almost a trillion dollars of cross-border commerce uh, every year. So I believe strongly that if we're going to take the $32 billion freight forwarding industry and transform it into a catalyst for more sustainable commerce, we had to build a big company. And that meant that we had to bring in investors with deeper pockets than, you know, my local friends and family who have been very supportive, (laughs) but aren't professional investors. So the first you know, designs that we did, the pitch decks that we were doing, all of this was geared at um, kind of building a company that had the growth trajectory of a venture backed startup. We started pitching investors, I think uh, about four months in to Jetstream and we got some very small Uh, angel checks, one from Hustle Fund, uh, which is actually increasing its investment in Africa as we speak, Um, and another called C5, which uh, ran an accelerator that no longer exists uh, in Washington, D.C. for for impact startups. That gave us enough funding to do our market research, figure out what our business model was going to be, and start to make revenues that were growing month over month, which was a big validation that not only did customers value the coordination service that we were doing to the supply chain, but they were willing to pay for it. Um, And once we started generating those revenues, that's when we started raising um, checks in the six figures and then in the seven figures. And that was around, um, you know, March to May of 2019 so i i was going to ask you considering you spent i mean you were raising for jetstream less than five months after you started how did you identify potential investors what were you looking for i was looking for investors who knew african startups and how the business models in africa don't look like those in the West. They look like those uh, more in Asia, um, 
and South America. So the first two investors that I identified both had portfolios in emerging economies. So Hustle Fund had a big portfolio in Southeast Asia and C5 Capital had a lot of startups in um, Asia, Latin America and Africa. I found the investors through networking. I think I actually applied to Hustle Fund um, online and someone who was working with our business had applied to them from a prior startup and did an introduction to reinforce the online application. I met one of the executives of C5 at a conference, a startup tech conference in South Africa and really clicked with her um, and just followed up with um, an application after I met her. After that, uh, small, small angel raise, most of the investors came through networking, through existing investors, through other founders, and through people I had met at events in Africa. So who was the first investor that committed to Jetstream? Because a lot of... Um, a lot of friend was the first, yeah. Oh, okay. So my next question would be around... You mentioned that you, you were able to identify these um, investors either through networking or maybe just meeting them at uh, at certain events. And there's this thing that some investors say, uh, don't wait until you have to, until you need to raise money before you actually start contacting investors. So the advice you should start a lot earlier. Um, so was that the process for you or... Yeah, you did you just meet them and then you guys were having fundraising discussions shortly after? It's a very good idea to look at fundraising like a marriage. And just as you wouldn't propose to your significant other uh, right after having met them, you shouldn't try to get investment from an investor who you just met. The better way to do it is to start fundraising before you need the money and start to build relationships. There's two way relationships where you're getting to know the investor and how they interact with you over time. And they're getting to understand you as a founder, what your vision is and how it's actually playing out real time. So if you believe you need money six to nine months from now, the time to be going to events and to be sending emails to investors and to have exploratory calls, that time is now. It takes about, in my experience, it, it, for the, the bigger, bigger investments that we've gotten, it takes at least six months to generate those types of relationships. If you're an underrepresented founder, quote unquote, underrepresented founder, because you're a woman or you were you were born on the continent of Africa and you went to school here or because you're from the north of the country where there's not a lot of um, commerce. If you're underrepresented in any way, you probably need more time than others to get to know investors because investors that you're talking to, for better or worse, are not just looking at your business. They're not just listening to your idea. They're doing extra scrutiny on you. And they're trying to figure out, is this person who I don't see in the league tables of top startups, is this type of person going to do well? And I think that for better or worse, invest, investing, you know, even for top VCs has a real big fear of missing out quality. And uh, if you're in the underrepresented category, you have to put extra effort into creating that FOMO effect um, in your fundraising process. Okay, so let's uh, let's ex uh, let's explore that idea of creating FOMO for investors. How how would you advise a first time founder to do, to go about doing that? It starts with your mindset. So, I think that um, for me personally, I'm I'm uh, not that great at bluffing. Like you know, people in my company say I'm I'm fairly emotionally transparent. And if I believe something is true, you can tell. And from a fundraising perspective, the way to use that to my advantage is to start again, fundraising when I don't need the money. And I really don't care if the person invests or not. That uh, confidence and that sort of 
take it or leave it attitude actually is persuasive um, to a lot of investors. So the first thing to start with is just getting your mind right and making sure that the way that you're telling the story, the way that you're presenting yourself to investors is as confident without being arrogant uh, and as um, precise as it needs to be to convey your message. I think the second big piece is to hold firm on deadlines. So uh, in our last round that we closed, we had very slow activity in the summer of 2022, and then 50% of our round closed in the last quarter um, when the broader tech markets had gone south, but the, like, the fundamentals of Jetstream were going strong. And I think that helped us uh, build a, a powerful story um, for in wow. investors. I believe that the closing date, like the fact that I set a date that we were going to, you know, close the round, you know, hell or high water was an accelerant to investors who were sort of on the fence. So for people who uh, were doing a lot of long diligence, et cetera, they knew that the date the uh, investment was going to close was the date. And that helped bring in a big surge of capital in the fourth quarter of last year. As I look forward to our next investment uh, milestone, which is our Series A, I have better relationships in the investment community, not just in Africa, but also in the West. And for that process, creating FOMO is all about finding the right lead. So when you do a priced round of investment, it's not on the Y Combinator safe document. It's not a convertible note. It's actually a round where you issue shares to your investors. It's important to have a strong lead who will basically vouch for your valuation and say to all of the other investors, this is how much the company is worth and we've done our full diligence around it. That's where my focus is today is like talking to all the investors that we've we've um, touched and, and learned about and finding out who's the right fit for Jetstream's lead in, in the next round. That lead um, is an anchor to the rest of your round and locking down the lead in short order when you need to and closing the rest of the round behind that lead is um, is the key, I think, to to building FOMO and like a very tight, tight round. Okay. Do you think that um, being a woman affected your chances of raising capital in any way? Of course it did. <laughs> so being being a woman, being an underrepresented founder in any way, and, and I say underrepresented because there's so much, there's so many ways that people can be biased against you. There's so many ways that people, reasons that people won't give you the benefit of the doubt. And being a woman is just one of those reasons. So it means that the default presumption when you walk into their office or you, you click into a Zoom call is that, you know, this person doesn't conform to the template of success that I've seen before. So it's highly likely that this person is not going to be successful. That's just what happens, not just in VC fundraising. It happens, you know, in, uh, you know, getting a job, it, it happens across the board. That being said, if you've been at this for a while, you've been a woman your entire life, or you've been an underrepresented uh, person your entire life, you probably have figured out ways around it. You know, you probably are more resilient than the average bear. You probably have developed uh, skills to navigate that bias that are sharper than the skills that someone who sort of walks in the door and gets the benefit of the doubt has um, has not had the opportunity to develop. So I do think that um, we at Jetstream are subject to a lot more diligence, a lot longer diligence than um, folks who are not underrepresented founders. Um, the way that we've navigated that is just to be super prepared. We have tight books. If you look at our team, the, the quality of their responses to investors, the speed at which they can uh, respond to information like the 
the ship that we're running is pretty tight. And it is that way because it has to be in order for us to, to raise funding. So I think that there are a lot of downsides to being underrepresented. You don't get the benefit of the doubt. But on the fundamentals, I believe strongly that underrepresented founders are building better businesses, pound for pound, kilogram for kilogram, than folks who get the presumption every time. What were some surprises you faced while you were raising for Jetstream at, at every point where you've had to raise? What were some things that happened and um, you were very surprised at them? In fundraising or, or generally in the business? In fundraising. Um, the biggest um, learning for me about fundraising is it's uh, how similar it is to so many other things in life and how, you know, as much as VCs try to present themselves as analytical and data driven, it's a relationship. And the intuitions that I have about the type of person I'm talking to when I'm, you know, having a conversation with VCs are remarkably aligned with how the investment uh, journey goes. I have said no to investors potentially writing big checks because of the way they interacted with me or my team during the diligence process. And again, as data driven and objective as we are as a business, those intuitive sense senses about the character of the person you're dealing with are relevant to the way that they will interact with you once they're on your cap table. So I, I guess I would say to, to boil it down, I would say trust your intuition with investors. And the relevance of character um, and whether the person shares your worldview and how they support your company or not support your company after they join your cap table is, I can't under, I can't understate, understate the, the importance of those soft things. Okay, so uh, what advice would you give a first-time founder who is trying to raise a fund? Um, what advice would you give them? What would you tell them to do and what would you tell them to avoid? In finding out how, figuring out how to have the most successful fundraising journey as a founder, you really have to start at the beginning of your business, understanding why you're building it. So if your objective is to build a lifestyle business and just have enough money to um, pay your bills and, and have a comfortable lifestyle, you may not need venture capital investment. You may require loans or grants or other sources of capital. That sort of self-assessment at the very early stages is going to have a massive impact on your success in raising at the later stages. Because if you decided early on that, you know what, what I really want to build is a lifestyle business, you're going to be um, designing your products, you're going to be recruiting a team that's appropriate for that type of business. And the investors that you attract are going to see an alignment between your why your design, the business model design, the product design, et cetera, and what they expect from you in terms of diligence and in terms of story uh, in order to invest in you. If you decide for whatever reason, this solution that I have or the problem that I'm trying to solve is so big and so appropriate for technology that I want to scale it into a multi-billion dollar company, I want to go public, I want to be acquired, etc. Then from the get-go, the work that you're putting into the company, the type of people you recruit to help build the company can't just be your friends. It's got to be the, the, the top, top contributors across the board. The amount of time that you spend developing your story and um, reaching out to investors, especially if you're coming from Africa where 
the investment community is small, it'll completely change your life and it'll shape the, 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 it'll shape what your day to day life looks like. If you made that decision from the beginning, I believe that you will see long term um, that decision that I want to be a venture backed startup start to uh, yield results and you'll start to see successes um, if that's genuinely what you want. And if you design your business, you design your team, you design your business model, everything is sort of aligned with that. I don't think you should back into a business model or a problem based on your desire to raise venture capital. I think that's a that's not a long term sustainable motivation, but you can do it the other way where you say this is a problem I want to solve and venture capital is, is appropriate for that. And that will definitely define how you build the business. OK, uh, so thank you so much for your time, Misha. This was really interesting. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's always nice to talk to the Tech Point team.